before I. Uh, but uh, it's been a busy uh, week uh, this past week. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, Tori and I, we were at Fuel this past week, and I just had a phenomenal time uh, really pouring in and investing in the lives of uh, the youth within the church. It's always one of my favorite weeks of the year, and it held true again this year. Um, and then I got home on Friday, and Jamie's uh, sister and family were here to greet me as they were visiting. So we had three lovely uh, little kiddos uh, running around uh, to give me that uh, juice of energy that I needed after a week long of camp. Because if you don't know anything about camp, church camp, you don't really get much sleep during a church camp. So I needed uh, that boost of energy. Um, and then on Tuesday, this upcoming Tuesday, Jamie's headed down to South Carolina with her family. And so that means that this upcoming week, it is going to be a boys week. Uh, we had a boys week um, back around March or February, I forget exactly um, when, um, but I'm hoping that this time around with our boys week that Ezra won't play in the toilet at all. I mean, he only did that once last time uh, we had a boys week, and but I think we can beat that record. I think we can get it down to zero um, this week, but it's going to be a great week as I love spending time with Ezra as he is my little buddy. He's always uh, been my little buddy. I remember um, back to the day that he was born, I was able to be in the room uh, with Jamie as she had an emergency C-section. They needed to put her under. Um, and uh, I remember, uh, so I was out waiting in this strange room by myself. And after about an hour, they rolled him to me. I got to see him for about 15 minutes. And I remember being pretty disappointed because I hear of these stories of these fathers, these mothers seeing their child for the first time and, oh, their child just stole their heart, but uh, that didn't really happen. He, he, he didn't steal my heart right then and there as I just got to see him. I didn't really get to hold him or anything, um, and I remember being disappointed. It wasn't until later on that day um, where I saw him with all of his tubes and wires as he uh, was having uh, his mild difficulties there. Um, I remember that it was at that moment that, man, this little guy, he has truly stolen my heart, and this kid means uh, so much to me. And many of you guys probably have many similar memories like that where you see your child being born, and that child just t steals your heart, or you may have that affection for your loved one. Your loved one may just steal your heart away the first time you saw the love of your life walk down the aisle or the first time you guys went on the first date. I, of course, have many of those great memories uh, with Jamie, like our wedding day, the day we uh, got engaged, our honeymoon, and, and, and so forth. Um, and for me personally, I don't know about you guys, but with all these great memories that I have with Ezra and Jamie and all that they mean to me and the rest of my family, I have to be wary of the temptation to make Jamie, to make Ezra, to make my parents, to make my siblings an idol in my life. As the, these relationships that we have with one another, they can absolutely serve as an idol to us. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning as we continue our discussion on combating our idols. Last week, we introduced uh, this series, and we talked about what exactly an idol is. And an idol is anything or anyone that is more important to you than God. You know, we took a look at uh, the example of the Israelites, and in my uh, opinion, this was the greatest fault that the Israelites had. They were constantly putting other things or other people or other gods above God, and God detests that. God is a jealous God. He's jealous for our love and our affection, and because of this issue of idolatry, it led the Israelites down so many paths that they were not meant uh, to go down. And so one of the main idols that we'll be talking about this series um, is the idol of our relationships that we're talking about today. And I want to start uh, talking about these main different idols. I want to start with our relationship because I think this might be the most common idol in this room. If I had to guess, I would guess that, yeah, the relationships that, the relationships that we have with one another, with our family, with our children, with our boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, whomever it may be, friends, I'm guessing that this is the most common idol uh, that we may have in our lives. As I would bet, it would be the most common idol here in the country of the United States. 
Now, but before we talk about the idol of relationships, I think we all need to understand that relationships are a good thing. They are a very good thing. According to Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And at the end of these six days, God looked at his creation and he said it was very good. It was a very good world that God had created. Now, however, the first thing that was not good about God's creation was that man was alone. Adam, the first man that God created, he was alone, and God saw that, and God said, this is not good. This needs to be remedied. This needs to be fixed because man is not meant to be alone. And so what did God do? God uh, formed a a person out of Adam, uh, out of the man. He created the woman, Eve. And so Adam and Eve, they were able to start their own relationship. And and they ended up being able to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they had their, their own kids as well. And so they established the very first family here on earth. And this was a good thing. This, this was the remedy to the issue of man being all alone. And so that relationship, those family relationships, they are good. They were designed by our perfect creator. They're designed by God. And we take a look at like uh, Jesus in the New Testament talking about the greatest commandments. The first one is to love God with all that we have. And the second commandment is to love our neighbor as ourself. And so as we talk about the idol of relationships, we have to understand that relationships are a very, very good thing in our lives. I would dare say that you all have relationships in your life that positively impact you, that positively benefit you. Because when we are alone, uh, we can go crazy at times. Now, the issue is when we make these different relationships, when we make these good things, these good relationships into the ultimate relationship, into our ultimate thing, the, the ultimate thing in our worlds. And we have to remember that, again, an idol is anything or anyone that is more important to us than God. So if your spouse, if your children, if your friends, if those relationships that you have with them are more important to you than God, then I would dare say they are an idol in your life. And now we all have to fight this temptation because we all have those extremely close relationships, whether it's friends or family, whomever, whomever it may be. And we have to fight this tendency to, to make our human relationships more important than our relationship with God. And one person who had to face this temptation front on was a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham had the temptation to put his family over God. And he was given this test. He was given a test that, that, hey, do you you value your family more or do you value your heavenly father more? And this is a test that Abraham actually had to go through in his life. And we can read about this test in Genesis chapter 22. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. And we're going to be reading from Genesis chapter 22 this morning. So a bit about Abraham. Abraham, he was the patriarch of the Jewish faith. God, earlier in uh, Genesis chapter 12, God made a covenant. A covenant um, is like a promise. It's like an agreement where if you fulfill your side of the agreement, then I'll fulfill my side of the agreement. And, And God made this covenant with Abraham saying, hey, if you go and leave your home country to the land that I'll show you, then guess what, Abraham? I am going to make you into a great nation. And so God established this covenant that his descendants would be as numerous of the sea of the sand on the seashore and as numerous as the stars of the sky and the dust of the earth. Basically, his descendants would, would be uh, innumerable. You, you would not be able to count them because of how many descendants he has uh, uh, down along his line. And so God made this covenant with Abraham when he was 75 years old. Now, the issue with Abraham at this point in time when he was 75 years old, guess how many children Abraham had? Zero. He didn't have a single descendant to his name at the age of 75. Fast forward um, 15 years, and Abraham, he, he still has no children with his beloved wife, Sarah. 
they, they, they are demoralized, and Sarah actually tells Abraham to go sleep um, uh, with uh, her servant, Hagar. And so uh, she conceives and gives birth to Ishmael. So Ishmael is technically the first child um, that Abraham had. Now, the issue is Ishmael was kind of seen as an illegitimate uh, child um, when it comes to God's covenant because it wasn't with uh, Abraham's wife. It was with his wife's servant. And so as far as the covenant is concerned, that was not the child of Abraham. It was seen as an illegitimate child. And so in chapter 21, uh, Ishmael, the, the, the son of Abraham and Hagar, uh, the, the servant in whom uh, Abraham slept with, they were sent off as Sarah, she got jealous, even though it was her plan all along. Girls don't know what they want until they have it, and then they don't want it anymore. Um, Girls are complicated. And that, that was Sarah here. I'm sorry. Um, I mean. Uh, but uh, that's what took place here. Sarah wanted something, and then she saw it. And was like, actually, I don't want that. And so she cast off Hagar and Ishmael. And so they are out of the picture. And so here, Abraham, he's an old man. Sarah is, is, is an old lady, and they have no children. They have no descendants to fulfill this covenant that God made with Abraham that he would turn into this great and mighty nations and his descendants would be as numerous as the stars of the sky. Well, as we know, when God makes a promise, when God makes a covenant, he's going to keep his side of the agreement. Abraham already kept up his side of the agreement as he left his home country. Um, and, and so God, he, he did eventually fulfill his side of the covenant. And he gave Abraham and Sarah a baby boy. And his name was Isaac. So the one and only beloved son, uh, when, when we're looking through the eyes of the covenant, the one son that Abraham had finally could be fulfilled through Isaac, the, this promise that his family would be very, very big, basically, that he would have a very big family. And so I can only imagine the love that Abraham and Sarah would have had for uh, their child, Isaac. You know, some people, um, when, when they wait a long time to have kids, they have difficulties having kids, it's all the more valuable when they're finally able to have kids and they are overjoyed. I can only imagine the joy and the love that Abraham and Sarah would have had for Isaac. And on top of just the, the delay in being able to have kids, the, it, he was the fulfillment to this covenant that God made with Abraham. And so everything was all peachy. They were starting their family until we get to Genesis chapter 22. And so we read in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, it reads, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So here God told Abraham to take his only son Isaac and offer him up as a burnt offering. As again, Ishmael is out of the picture. And so as far as God's covenant is concerned, Isaac really is Abraham's only son. And I love here that, that God, as he's describing this only son, Isaac, who Abraham has, he says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Whom you love. Abraham loves this child. He loves his own flesh and blood, Isaac. And God told Abraham to take his one and only son, the, the son in whom he loves, to go and offer him up as a burnt offering. So here, God is putting Abraham to the test. Listen up, Abraham. Is your son Isaac more important to you? Or am I, your heavenly father, more important to you? So the question we should ask is, how does Abraham respond? How does he answer this test? We see that answer in verse 3. Verse 3 reads, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told them. Abraham obeyed the voice of God. 
without questioning or doubting as far as we know, he went and he obeyed. He rose early the next morning. Abraham, he, he, he didn't delay. God called him to do something and Abraham obeyed this voice without delaying, without questioning, even if it meant sacrificing his only son, the son in whom he loved. It was early in the morning. And so Abraham and Isaac, they started this journey as they went to go um, offer Isaac up as an uh, offering. And they took with them uh, two men uh, to accompany them in this journey. And in verse 4 we read, On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the word, took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. So verse 4, if we rewind back to verse 4, it starts, On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes. So on the third day of Abraham and his son on this journey, of which Abraham is about to sacrifice his only son whom he loves. So Abraham, he has three days. Three days to really consider this. I imagine there wasn't much discussion as they were traveling. They, they were walking towards this destination. And so for three days, Abraham had to wrestle with these thoughts. He had to wrestle with these thoughts. Do I really love God more than I do my son Isaac? Is this really worth it? Is this really what God called me to do? You know, that, that might be a great excuse. Hey, God, you, your, your calling wasn't clear enough. I'm not going to go offer up my son because I'm not sure that's really what you want. And so for three days, Abraham could have been contemplating this. He could have been coming up with all the excuses in the world. But nevertheless, they move, continue on in this journey, and they get to uh, the foot of the mountain, and uh, Abraham tells the, the men who are accompanying him, say, stay here. I and the boy are going to come back you. This is great faith that Abraham had. Hindsight, we learn when we read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. We won't read it, but it, but it talks about how Abraham reasoned that God could raise his son from the dead. So Abraham, he, 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 had, a, he had a roller coaster experience of faith throughout his life, but this is like the peak of his faith. He had faith that God could even raise his son from the dead if that's really what God wanted. And so as they're on their way, now it's just Abraham and his son Isaac, and in a sentimental moment here, Isaac asks, Dad, we have the wood, we have something to make a fire, but we're missing something, Dad. What about the lamb? We don't have anything to sacrifice. We have nothing for the burnt offering. <laughs> and I can't imagine the pain this must have put on Abraham's heart and how he would have had to respond to his son. I would have been speechless. But Abraham assured Isaac that God would provide. God will provide. And so we continue in verse 9 of chapter 22, and it reads, When they came to the place, so this is Isaac and Abraham coming to the place of which God had told them. Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket behind, by, by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. 
And so Abraham, he went and he built that altar and he bound his son up on the altar. I find it incredible um, that, uh, at least it's not recorded, Isaac, he, he, he wasn't fighting this. You know, he wasn't fighting being bound up by um, his, his father, Abraham. And so here Abraham was, he bound his son up on the altar and he has a knife in his hand ready to slaughter his only son whom he loves. And as he's getting ready to do this, as he raises the knife in his hand, behold, an angel comes and God provides. God provides for Abraham. And the angel said, look, there was a ram caught up in a thicket, and they were able to offer up the ram instead of Abraham's son, Isaac. And so Abraham answered this mightily difficult question. Who is more important to me? My son, my only son Isaac, whom I love, or God? And Abraham answered that question by being very willing up to the very end to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And because of this, because Abraham obeyed God's calling, God actually blessed Abraham and his family. Because Abraham put God above his son Isaac, God blessed them and their family. It was to their benefit that Abraham placed God above Isaac. It's to exactly Isaac's benefit. And so I can't imagine uh, being in the shoes of Abraham and God calling me to sacrifice my only son, Ezra, the son in whom I love. Um, If you could just imagine, put yourself in Abraham's shoes, having to straddle your child down on the altar because this is the calling that God had for you. And just imagining if you would go through it for, for God's sake. I'm not sure I would have it in me, but here Abraham, he answered this calling of God, and God provided. God provided for Abraham and Isaac and their family. Now, the fact of the matter is that the chances are none of us are going to have to go through a proposition like this where we have to sacrifice our children, but we need to ask ourselves, what would we do? What would we do? Is our children more important to us than God? That's a question we all have to consider. That's a question we all have to contemplate this morning. You know, Jesus kind of echoes this sentiment that we need to have God uh, first and foremost in our life. Jesus echoes this in Luke chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke chapter 14 in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. In Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through uh, 27, Jesus is talking about this issue of our relationships with our family in contrast to our relationship with God. And so it reads in chapter 14, verse 25, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to, and, and he turned and said to them, so this is Jesus teaching to a crowd, if anyone, anyone, not just some people, but if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is a passage uh, that really uh, throws people in for a loop. If we take a look at the parallel passage in Matthew, so that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're all about similar events and similar conversations. In the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, the phrase, loves more than me, is used rather than hate. So if you love your, if you love your mother, if you love your father, if you love your siblings, your children more than me, then you cannot, then you are not my disciple. But here, even if we use this word hate, this word hate is often used as an idiomatic expression to contrast our love to our family, uh, to contrast our love of our family with that of our love for God and Jesus. So basically, we just need to love our family less than our love for God and his son, Jesus. And Jesus continues in, in verse 28, and he reads, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king at war, will, li- will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? 
And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And so Jesus continues this, this discussion talking about our love for God in contrast to our love for family. And he uses uh, two examples. He uses the example of someone who is getting ready to build a tower. And he uses another example of a king ready to go to war. Now, when we are getting ready to build a tower, build a house, or, or go to war, we all think about the cost beforehand. That, or at least we should. That would be the wise choice to consider the cost beforehand. As you don't want to go halfway through the project, halfway through building a tower, or halfway through going to war and realize that, hey, I don't have everything that is necessary to complete uh, this task at hand. And so therefore, we see the cost of discipleship, the cost of being a follower of Jesus, the cost of being a child of God, is that we have to be willing to renounce all that, ha that he has so that and if we don't do that, we cannot be Jesus' disciple. And so if it came down to it, we should be willing to give up all that we have. That is the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship, the cost of being a child of God is that God is number one in our lives. It's number one or no place at all. God doesn't take second place. God doesn't take third place. God doesn't take fourth place. It's either all or nothing. Either God is first place or God has no part in your life. That is the cost of discipleship. And again, the chances of any of us coming into a situation where either we confess uh, Jesus as our Lord and Savior or we give up our children, the chances of that are very slim. But if it did come down to it, what would you do? And even on a more mild manner, on a more mild scale here, are you going to give God the best of what you have? Or are you going to invest in your family, invest in your spouse, invest in your friends so much that you have nothing left for God? You know, when I look around at uh, this country, when I look around at the state of Christianity in general, this is how a lot of people roll. They invest in their family. They invest in these good relationships with their spouses and their kids and their friends and their coworkers. And they spend all of their energy, all of their time, all of their resources on these people and they have nothing left for God. And so all of a sudden, these good relationships turn into an idol. They turn into something that draws us away from God. And this idol of human relationships, it can be so, so dangerous. It can be so, so tempting. Because my relationship with Jamie is a good relationship. It's a relationship that God has blessed. My relationship with Ezra, it is a good relationship. It is a relationship that God has blessed. But when I make these good things, the ultimate things in my life, they then become an idol in my life. And so we can't put these good things into the ultimate things. But let me tell you, it is very, very tempting to put our family above God. As we get to see our family, we get to talk to our family and hear them talk to us. We, we get to see them face to face. And so it can be very tempting to love our family more than God, to love our spouses, to love our friends more than God. It's natural tendency to, to have more influence, to have a bigger impact with our human relationships than with our relationship with God, God whom we can't necessarily see face to face, a God in whom doesn't always respond audibly to us. It can be difficult. And so if your family is your number one priority, you are going to put your deepest hope and longings on them. And let me tell you, if they are your number one priority, you are going to crush them. You're going to crush your friends, you're going to crush your family, you're going to crush your spouses if they are your number one priority in life. If you put all of your hopes and you put all your desires in these people. Because let me tell you, nobody can deliver. Nobody can deliver at that level. 
Only God can deliver. Only God can deliver all of our heart's desires. Only God can deliver all of our longings that we have. And so if you actually make your family the number one priority in your life, you're only doing them harm. You're only doing them harm because they, they can't handle the pressure. Eventually, you're going to be disappointed because we all have sin. We all make mistakes. We all mess up. And when this takes place, we're disappointed. We become frustrated. We, we become maybe even bitter with them. And, and we've all seen this before. When people invest too much, when they invest too much, and, and all their marbles are in the bag of their family, and their family disappoints, and all of a sudden, their family becomes a big train wreck. That's the dangers of having our family as an idol in our lives or our spouses, whomever it may be. The fact of the matter is that there's only one set of arms in our life that will give you all of your heart's desires, and those arms belong to none other than God. People with a spouse, they need to realize this. People who are looking for a spouse, they need to realize this. People who have a family need to realize this. People who have the, these dreams and desires of having a loving family, they need to realize this, that only God is able to deliver at that level. And so we must all love God first and foremost in our lives. John Piper wrote a poem to his son uh, who was about uh, to get married. Um, and I want to read you all uh, that poem this morning. He writes to his son, Yes, love her. Love her more than life. Oh, love the woman called your wife. Go love her as your earthly best. Beyond this venture not, but lest your love become a fool's facade. Be sure to love her less than God. It is not wise or kind to call an idol by sweet names, and fall as in humility before a likeness of your God. Adore above your best beloved on earth, the God alone who gives her worth. And she will know in second place that your great love is also grace, and that your high affections now are flowing freely from a vow beneath these promises, first made to you by God. Nor will they fade for being rooted by the steam of heaven's joy, which you esteem and cherish more than breath and life, that you may give it to your wife. The greatest gift you give your wife is loving God above her life. And thus I bid you now to bless. Go love her more by loving less. I thought that was a beautiful poem written to John Piper to his son as he was getting ready to marry the love of his life. And in summary, his, John Piper wanted to deliver this message to his son that, hey, if you want to love your wife more, then love God first. Love God first if you want to love your life. Go love her more by loving less. And so sometimes we get so wrapped up in these good and these great relationships with our families, with our friends, and they become more important to us than God. And I caution each and every one of you to stay away from the idolatry of your human relationships, of any relationship that is more important to you than your relationship with God. And we can all learn from the brilliant example of Abraham this morning as he answered that test. He was put to that test and he answered the call. God was the most important person in his life, even though he loved his only son. And so if you find that you are in the midst of living this form of idolatry out, that your relationships are more important to you than God and listen carefully, the solution likely is not loving these people less. The solution is not loving people less, but the solution is loving God more. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the love that you've given to us as you laid down your one and only son for each and every one of us. Father, I thank you for the good relationships that we have, the relationships that we have with one another as a church family. I thank you for the relationships that we have back at home. Father, I pray that we are blessed and encouraged by these relationships. But Father, I pray that each and every one of us, we remember to put our relationship with you first and foremost, and that we learn to love you more, Father. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.